Excuse me, what will you do with your first salary? So I would like to present my first paycheck to my father. I'll buy a laptop for my younger brother. I will save some money and with the rest I'll get an AC for my dad's room. I'm going to start a life insurance policy. I think it's very important for my family's security. We're delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jai Pulitzer Festival protected by Tetol. Banega Swast India. The session is presented by LIC. It's a pleasure to present today Jai Jawan Jai Kisan, the Cornerstones, Kulpreet Yadav, Shivarur, Kota Nelima and Namita Waikar in conversation. The soldier and the farmer together, they uphold the cornerstones of society and nation. Writer Kulpreet Yadav's latest book, The Battle of Rizangla, is a retelling of a courageous true story of 120 Indian soldiers who faced 5,000 Chinese troops in 1962. Author Shivaru's golden book, India's Most Fearless, is a riveting account of the extreme bravery and selflessness shown by military personnel on a daily basis in the line of duty. Writer, translator, and managing editor at the People's Archive of Rural India, Namita Waikal's novel, The Long March, explores the continued fallout of the Indian agrarian crisis. Author, researcher, and political commentator, Kota Nilima's work specializes in rural distress gender and condition of women farmers, farmer suicides, and peripheries of democratic societies. Together, they explore the multi-layered paradoxes and challenges faced by these two groups that are inherent to the functioning of the country. Kulpreet Yadav is the author of 14 books and three screenplays of short films. An ex-army officer, Yadav also an actor, filmmaker, and entrepreneur. He divides his time between Delhi and Mumbai, and his latest book, The Battle of Rizangla, has been published by Penguin India. Shivarur is executive editor and anchor with India Today TV and founder of Flipfist, one of India's first digital platforms dedicated to defense and military news. A journalist for 19 years, he has reported from conflict zones in the subcontinent and abroad, winning awards for his work covering the Libyan war in 2011. Arur, along with Rahul Singh, has authored the best-selling India's Most Fearless, a collection of modern military accounts of Bella, winning Amazon's 2017 non-fiction book of the year, as well as its sequel. He also penned the military thriller novel, Operation Jinnah. All three of his books are being adapted for television and film. Namita Waikar is a writer, translator, and author. She's the managing editor of People's Archive of Rural India and writes for and anchors the Grind Milk Songs project. Waikar is currently working on a non-fiction book on the farmers' protest forthcoming with Melbourne University Publishing. She's also a partner in chemistry databases firm in Pune, which is culmination of her work over 20 years as a biochemist and a software project manager. Kota Nilima is an author, political scientist, and former journalist who writes on poverty, gender, electoral reforms, and democratic deficit. Nilima was senior research fellow, SAIS, John Hopkins University, Washington, DC, and is an alumna of Jawaharlal Nehru University and the University of Delhi. She's the director at the Institute of Perception Studies, New Delhi. Nilima has authored seven books and a recent work, Widows of Vidarbha, Making of Shadows, is a longitudinal study of farmer suicide households. One of her books has been optioned for a web series and another has been optioned for a movie. Ladies and gentlemen, Jai Jawan Jai Kisan, The Cornerstones, Kulpreet Yadav, Shivaru, Kota Nilima, and Namita Waikar in conversation. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, I'm happy to uh, participate in this discussion. Jai Jawan Jai Kisan, uh, which is a slogan coined by India's second prime minister, Lal Bahadur Shastri. Uh, and he done that to enthuse the soldiers and the farmers of this nation when we were at war with our neighbor in, with Pakistan in 1965. And at that time, our country was not self-sufficient in food production. We were dependent on imports. Now today the situation is that we aspire to become a superpower. We have the second largest military in the world and our food grain production during the last year reached a record 310 million tons. And yet our farmers were at Delhi's borders for over a year. They were stopped at the borders by the government from entering the capital. And uh, why were they stopped? They were protesting against the farm laws for over a year. And the farm laws, the three farm laws that they called the Kale Kanun or the black laws, 
it was the largest peaceful and democratic protest organized in the world during the pandemic the laws were an aggravation for farmers who were already battling crisis on many fronts uh, the rising costs of fuel the rising input costs for their farms and the declining price to their produce as well as the declining procurement by state and central governments and their ever growing indebtedness since 1995 uh, this is uh, part of public uh, in the public domain and part of government reports since 1995 there have been about 400000 farmers who took their own lives which is one of the many outcomes of the agrarian crisis now among the protesters there were several farmers men as well as women whose sons are serving in the armed forces there were also some veterans retired uh, armed forces people who joined the protesters to show their solidarity and after a year of this non violent protest when the farmers lived at the borders of delhi uh, the government finally retreated and they repealed the farm laws that had gained a uh, global notoriety now on the other hand when we talk about our jawans on the borders with our neighbors in particular our border with china uh, it's a border that is still not mutually agreed on and settled on by india and china and on the other side pakistan side we still have skirmishes with them so what is the condition of our soldiers do we honor them enough do we equip them well with the tools and equipment required to fight the battles they have to uh in the coldest seasons in the himalayas as they guard our borders now on our panel today we have uh some eminent writers uh and reporters and researchers and uh, kulpreet yadav uh, has recently published a book on the 1962 war with china the battle of rezangla and uh, one of shivarur's latest book is the third in a series of india's most fearless and we also have kota nilima and one of her many books is the widows of vidarbha where she has talked about rural distress especially the condition of women farmers and widows of farmers who committed suicide uh, her research is also about democratic societies and processes what i bring here is my own experience with the people's archive of rural india and uh, my novel the long march which is based on the farmers crisis in our country now together we are going to explore as the uh, program says uh, of the session uh, the multi layered paradoxes and challenges faced by these two groups the farmers and the soldiers that are inherent to the functioning of the country so let me start off by uh, calling on uh, kuldeep yadav to tell us a little about uh, what's happening at the india china border but before that also about your book and uh, we would love to hear that because it's very rare to have a book on the india china war Oh uh, thank you very much Namita um it's a pleasure to be here in this uh, session with very eminent writers um i wrote battle of rezangla uh, uh it came out in september last year so it's just been about 4 uh, 4 and 1/2 months the reason that i wrote this book was because nobody wants to as you as you said very few books on 1962 people don't want to talk about it um 1965 of course uh, was uh, a battle that india had done far better and there are plenty of books there are books on 62 as well but uh, to my uh, you know um, surprise and shock over the years i saw that when it comes to rezangla which was actually the only bright spot in this entire 1962 war against china uh, there's just a page or a page and half or two page mention uh, about this battle and uh, i hail from south haryana and that is a place from where 
you know, 95% of the people, you know, the Jawans who fought this battle, they came from. And two of them were related to me. So I saw this kind of a difference in the nation where when I go to village from, from my childhood, my father was in Air Force. So uh, I was in Chandigarh most of the time. After that, I was in Pune. During my school and college, I used to come back from village and talk about, you know, Battle of Rezangla. And nobody had heard of it, Battle of Rezangla. Even in 1991, when I stepped into the uh, Naval Officers Academy, I went to the library, I spoke to my instructors. Nobody knew about Battle of Rezangla. For 23 years, I was a commissioned officer. I wore uniform, I commanded ships. I went here and there, but nobody had heard. So one of the reasons was to actually uh, bring out this book uh, you know, uh, and let let everyone know that this is the kind of sacrifice that uh, that our people did. You know, in in brief, out of 120 uh, Jawans who were there there on 18th November 1962 at Rizangla, and one officer that is Major Shaitan Singh, Major Shaitan Singh, and 110 Jawans made the supreme sacrifice of uh, of giving up their lives for the security and protection of our motherland. Chinese were desperate; there were 5,000 of them. They wanted to capture uh, Rezangla Pass. From there, they wanted to go to Chushul Airfield, which was actually the nerve center for the entire region. And probably we would have lost the entire uh, Ladakh region. That was one reason. Second reason is, uh, Navita, to be very frank with you, I've seen this very officer-centric approach in India. I come from rural Haryana. All, all my relatives are in Haryana. Then they're, most of my relatives and friends are actually very, you know, in that sense, they are from villages. And... Uh, I don't think why talk about 1962, even 1965 and 70, 72, uh, there are uh, uh, there are no uh, 71 there, there are no uh, books on you know which talk about section level and platoon level, jawan centric, airman centric, sailor centric war, and it's always what the officers did, right? So I wanted to write an authentic account of this battle which actually penetrates down to every single Jawan and what really happened that night. Thank you, Kulpreet. That was very insightful. Um, I would like to uh, ask Shiv Arur. I mean, you also report for India Today and uh, on the armed forces as well as current happenings, current news. So I would like to... Uh, share a little about what your books are about the India's most fearless as well as uh, the current today's topic of the soldiers and the farmers so you know uh, thank you very much uh, for that introduction uh, namita and to all my fellow panelists uh, uh, you know the, the phrase jai jawan jai kisan uh, resonates uh, very deeply with me uh, uh, because um, i've read very much about uh, what that was about, you know, the circumstances that you describe uh, during the 65 war, uh, but also because uh, as a journalist and a writer now, uh, uh, both of those worlds are constantly colliding. Uh, as a as a writer and a defense correspondent for, uh, for many years, uh, uh, you know, my life has been telling the stories of soldiers and covering the military. Uh, and as a, uh, you know, as an editor now, it has been covering one of the biggest stories of our times, this, this huge protest by farmers uh, in our national capital, something that uh, you know, rightfully made international headlines. Uh, the, the, the worlds I occupy see these two, both these worlds of farmers and soldiers uh, you know, intersect constantly. I mean, in, in many cases, they don't, you, know, you can't even distinguish between them because like you rightly said, uh, Namita, uh, most soldiers or many soldiers, hundreds of thousands of soldiers, uh, you know, are the children of farmers. Uh, many soldiers, uh, you know, who retire quite young, go back to farming after they've, uh, you know, hung up their combat boots. Uh, uh, just to speak a little bit about uh, the two India's Most Fearless books I've written and the one that's coming up. Uh, there are, I think, about 28 stories in the two books. Out of those, I would, I would guess that at least 20 of those uh, are about soldiers who belong to farmer families. Uh, you know, most of them are no longer alive. They, you know, they they were killed in action in battle, and you know, we had the privilege to tell their stories. But they came from farming families. Uh, uh, in the in the book that's coming up, India's Most Fearless Three uh, uh, was a was a man whose video has gone viral, receiving his Shaurya Chakra from the president just uh, you know a few weeks ago. He's right now in. In, uh, back in the Northeast, he's back with his, um, doing his farming. He's back there doing his farming. He's 
away from the spotlight. He's given up everything else. Didn't want to, you know, live in the city. Constant correspondence. And this guy is a, a soldier who's won a Shaurya Chakra, third highest peacetime military honor. And he's back there growing his carrots and potatoes and what have you. And, you know, doesn't want any of the publicity. Even when we wrote the chapter about him, he was like, you know, you know, I, I did what I was trained to do. You know, anybody else in my position would have done the same. So that, that metaphor of humility is, you know, there are so many common things between soldiers and farmers. There's humility. There's a constant cloud of unpredictability in their lives, uh, you know, about where things are going to go. Things go this way and the other and your life is finished. It's the same with farmers, with, with weather and so many other variables that can, you know, change their destinies. Uh, uh, I, I'll just end by uh, this particular answer by relating one small incident because it, uh, it, it really spoke to me. It really, really spoke to me. This, this was a story of a, of a very young officer from our second book, uh, you know, who was killed in action in a, in a terrifyingly brave operation in North Kashmir in Gurez. Uh, and his father, who's from Punjab, from border Punjab, farmer, farming family, they went to Gurez a few weeks later. Uh, and uh, the people from his unit say, his father say, show me the place where my son fell. Show, show me that same place. And he apparently went there and he took a, you know, two hands full of the soil where his son fell, uh, put it in a bottle and he took it back and he scattered it all over his field. You know, uh, these are, these, these things, I, I can't imagine them not speaking to someone. I mean, imagine of a family that's lost their boy you know, he'd gone and done hotel management. He was frustrated with that, said, I don't want this. I want to be a soldier. Went, became an officer. Within a couple of years of his commissioning, he fell in action. And uh, then you had this farmer family, which was wondering, you know, I've brought my son back as sand to put in this field. So uh, it's, it's incredible. Right through our entire coverage, I will, I will end by saying that, um, uh, you know, there has been discomfort about the protests. There has been... There have been many emotions because these two worlds, like I said, are, uh, you know, they're very difficult to distinguish between them at most times. There are so many soldiers who are farmers and vice versa. Uh, thank you, Shiv. I, that uh, story about the farmer who took his son's uh, uh, ashes, so to speak, the soil from his uh, grounds and put it in his fields, that's really touching. Um, uh, Nilima, you have done a lot of research on the rural distress, on uh, farmers, as well as uh, the widows of farmers who committed suicide. I want to, I want you to bring in here the uh, the finer aspects of the farm laws and how they affect the farmers and why why were the farmers compelled to go on this protest. Uh, you're on mute. Yeah. Thank you, Namita. Um, great to be on this brilliant panel with uh, two, three fabulous authors writing on uh, two very important issues, farmers and soldiers. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. As you correctly said, I've been uh, researching all my life about uh, farmers and I think that uh, I haven't I haven't even crossed the halfway mark. There's so much to explore as both Kulpreet and Shu and you have been saying, there's so much to write. Um, yes, the, the protest on the farm laws was a, a high watermark of, uh, you know, farmer unity and the kind of opinions they have about policy. But I think in that, that in no way, you know, actually, however massive it is, however historic it is, I think the, the invisibility of the farmer is much beyond that, even today. I think India in that way is an invisible republic. And that's where I see both the soldiers and their families, as well as farmers and their families. Now, coming to you know, the, the, the issue of gender, which you had talked about, and in my book, Widows of Vidarbha, I talk about the seven ways in which invisibility of the widows is also executed once the farmer commits suicide. Now, why we take the farmer suicide as a central point to understand distress is because that's where all these aspects converge on the different kinds of invisibilities which are imposed on the farmer. So a woman would, for instance, 
face invisibility is based on opportunity, value, vote even, procedure of the government procedure, ownership of property, uh, status and tradition, of course. And they, not all of them, not all of them are imposed just by society. A lot of that is also endorsed by the state, the governments. Um, also, what I have been trying to do with my work over a period of the last, I guess, uh, one and a half uh, decades, I think 15 years, is to normalize the narratives so that we can visibilize them. We can regularize the visibility of the farmer. We can regularize the visibility that they have an opinion on policy, which is what we saw in, in, uh, in during the farm laws thing. Now, one aspect of the farm laws, which is still pending, and which is why I was uh, you know, saying that the invisibility is much beyond what we saw on Delhi borders, which I would say only conditional visibility for a particular period of time, they made headlines. Now they are back into darkness. Look at the MSP issue. The very, very central issue to this entire agitation, and perhaps all the generations which have passed before and all the generations which are going to come afterwards, agriculture has to be based on a benchmark price of MSP. A committee was promised. And where is the committee today? We have the end of the farm agitation. There have been lives lost. And uh, when, when I remember the times, I mean, the few times where, which I spent with them, it was so tough for these people to live on the roads for almost a year just outside the uh, just outside the capital and they were promised something which they believed which was msp where is that committee where is the assurance on uh, on msp what is the future so are we saying they are pushed back into that invisibility from which they had come no that's that's one point which i wanted to make and i totally agree with what she had said i think there are so many things common between uh, the jawan and the kisan and both come from the soil the soldier is a different version of the farmer, I believe. And the farmer is a different version of the soldier. I think there is no difference on that. They serve the nation and uh, one on the border, one on the agricultural fields. But they, I think they differ only in one aspect and that is when they die or in the manner in which they lay down their lives. A soldier becomes a martyr when he dies for the nation. And a farmer dies despite the nation. And this is the big difference. A farmer's suicide is despite all the promises of this nation has been uh, making to the farmer, especially the poor, the small and marginal farmer. And his or her death is not even considered a suicide. In many cases, we all know how difficult it is to put that number, even for the farmer to turn into a statistic, is a struggle. And that's because a farmer's suicide looks bad. Uh, you know, to the government. They, they, it makes the governments look bad. So that's where I think the Jawan and the Kisan, Barry, they lead lives dedicated to the nation, but when they die, one is a martyr, one is not even a number. Yeah. Uh, taking, taking off on what you said, uh, Kota uh, Nilima, is, uh, you know, what you talked about, how a farmer's death suicide is invisible and it's just a number. Uh, I know that there is something called an eligible suicide, you know, that is defined as which of the farmers who committed suicide will get compensation. I mean, their families would get compensation and there are rules laid down for that. And uh, this is totally in the hands of the police constable who goes there to survey, to find out, you know, what is the condition, in whose name was the land title. If, if that farmer was uh, uh, working on a lease land for which he doesn't hold the title, he will not be getting the compensation. His family will not be getting compensation because he doesn't fall under the eligible suicide category. Secondly, um, I think you mentioned uh, in quite detail about the invisible invisibility of the farmers and especially the women farmers. Uh, most of them do not have uh, land rights. They don't own the title of the land, even if uh, we know that women perform over 70% of the work on farms. And as more and more men migrated to cities because farming became uh, not 
profitable at all. In fact, it was loss making. And farmers have to look for other jobs to, you know, make up for the money they lose in farming and go out to uh, find new jobs in, in the cities, on construction sites, etc. So women are burdened with even more of the work that even the men used to do. So this, this aspect of the disparity between, you know, how the men and women are treated where they are farmers. I want to extend it a little bit and talk about the disparity in, uh, in the Jawans where they are men as well as, and women. Like uh, recently, very recently, uh, uh, NDA has started, uh, opened up admissions for women. And we know that until very recently, uh, women could only get short service commissions uh, in the armed forces. So uh, can, uh, can you shed some light on that, uh, Kulpreet? I mean, you, you have yourself been uh, in the Navy and you have some experience as well as Shiv, if you could add to that after this, after Kulpreet. So, uh, yeah, so I think what you're trying to ask is uh, um, the, the increased participation of women that yeah. has started now in the armed forces, uh, starting with NDA. Um, I really do not know whether I have the complete information right now or not, because I retired in 2014, uh, which was, uh, which was quite some time back. Right. Um, but, uh, I come from a generation where when I was in the academy, there were no women, uh, cadets, right. They started coming only later. So right. the training and the orientation and, uh, you know, uh, the ragada, what we call, you know, the, the punishment, et cetera were all very, uh, very different than it, it happened, you know, after the women um, started joining the armed forces. Anyway, the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is, I think it's a, it's a step in the right direction. And there are, of course, many international countries uh, that we can look at for uh, understanding how really we can dovetail uh, the women's strengths and capabilities into our armed forces and make it a more cohesive, more equal armed forces. What really has happening in, on the ground, I'm afraid I really do not have that much information. I think Shiv would be the right person to talk about this. Yeah. Shiv. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Namita, uh, um, it's, a, it's a long road. There is so much, there is so much uh, that has not been done as far as women in the armed forces is concerned. Uh, this was actually a really hot story and uh, Kota might remember that uh, you know, 15 years ago when, uh, you know, there was a, a famous report in the mid 2000s uh, about uh, involving women more in the armed forces. When I think about that, it's actually funny because we've come so way beyond that report now, much more than what that report had recommended has actually been done. Uh, women fighter pilots, uh, women on frontline warships, women uh, uh, on maritime patrol aircraft as observers, um, women in many more of the armies, um, uh, you know, uh, arms uh, that, uh, you know, uh, unlike what they were uh, barred from earlier, of course, they're still not allowed in the actual frontline combat arms, uh, uh, you know, which is which is an issue. Uh, but uh, there is a huge amount left to do. They're, they, they're there in the core of the military police. Uh, the, their induction as uh, uh, women fighter pilots has been made, uh, uh, you know, a permanent thing. It was an experiment until just a few months ago, it's now been made into a permanent scheme in the armed forces. Uh, so uh, it's not like things haven't happened. Things have happened in the last, uh, I think, since 2000, 2005, 2006 onwards, if you see, uh, you know, under, under both these governments. This is actually, you know, one really good thing to see. In, in defense, actually, one of the good things to see is uh, 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 there is a lot of con continuity in terms of policy decisions. Uh, you know, the, you don't see the usual BJP Congress, Tutu Meme, over... Uh, you know, more sort of frontline issues. Uh, you, you won't see people reversing policy decisions uh, much in the defense forces because there it takes a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of mental capital and research and things like that. So women in the armed forces is one thing that, um, uh, which is, it, it's, it's a good thing that, you know, all, all administrations have agreed on, uh, you know, actually uh, pushing it through. But, but like I said, the, the, the road ahead is, is, is a vast one. There are sensitivities. Because, because um, uh, there is also a huge mindset issue. Kulpreet, sir, would know that even better. There is a mindset issue within the armed forces. 
yeah, yeah, Namita said we, we've got the second largest, uh, you know, uh, land land fighting force in the world. Uh, we've got people from all over the country. Uh, you know, uh, soldiers from the rural belt. There are there are mind there are there are real there are real mindset changes. There are people who say, look, the armed forces is not a place to do gender experiments. There are actually people who will actually say that in uh, you know uh, workshops and sensitization events about you know putting more women into the armed forces. Then equally, you will have people who say, but you know what about the cost of training? Because you know women will sort of run off and get pregnant, and then what happens to everything? So there are those extreme views also, and then there are there, and then there are uh, uh, you know uh, uh, suggestions, and I agree with these suggestions that look create an open playing field, let it be about merit, let it be about ability. You you you, you create a benchmark for everyone. Whoever passes that, let it be. I mean, it's not like it's not like women are a new species on this planet. Okay, the military is not new. M women are new, oh, uh, not new. Open it up and you know let everyone have a fair. Uh, you know, contest to enter and serve the military. It's not compulsory. Women want to be in the military. It's not. It's not something new, and they've done it for a long time. You see headlines from time to time about, uh, you know, uh, women in the Supreme Court, about permanent commission, about wanting to be in the combat arms. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a war. It's a fight. It's a, it's a battle daily for women. You know, it's just one more battle that women are having to fight, and that's about uh, being available in more places in the armed forces. And I think it's a, it's a noble battle that's worth fighting and but the good thing is it's not it's not something that's just stuck it's moving it's moving slowly but it's moving so i have faith in that yeah thank you uh, shiv uh, that was uh, very good uh, you know talking about how men and women are uh, have to compete and women have to work harder uh, uh, to get to the position that men are in the military and um, i this you know, this line of uh, women will go off and get pregnant that is so common, not just in the armed forces, but everywhere else in corporates, in all kinds of jobs. And um, I just want to say uh, to the people who use that line that when women go off and get pregnant, I mean, in any place, whether it's a company, a private sector, public sector or armed forces, uh, there are men working there whose women, whose wives do get pregnant, you know, and they continue to work. So it's, it's not like, you know, it's a standalone fact. It's uh, whether the women are in the army or armed forces or anywhere else, the men too are part of this process. So uh, it's something that is completely forgotten, you know, when they make statements like that. Um, I want to come back to... Uh, the three farm laws and uh, speak a little about, you know, the, the democratic culture of our country and how, how that has been changing, uh, especially in the way the ordinances were made and the farm laws were passed in the parliament. And in fact, when, when the prime minister decided to repeal the farm laws and then, um, I mean, uh, he actually declared it on television and and also said the farmers can now go home, you know, as if uh, that that was like an absolute kind of a command. Uh, when the laws were repealed in Parliament as well, the process was as swift as the passing of the la laws was. So, uh, Nilima, can you speak a little about? you know, the, the democratic process in our parliament and how it's changing over the years and how can we, uh, how can we as citizens, you know, uh, tackle this or address this as citizens and as voters? Thank you, Namita. That was a uh, fabulous question. Uh, in the introduction, I had said about India being an invisible Republic. And uh, this was one of the things which at the back of my mind about how policy is made in this country without any interaction or, or, or very less interaction with the stakeholders. I mean, there is a laid down procedure for deliberation. I mean, this is supposed to be a deliberative democracy. It was supposed to be participatory democracy. Now it is becoming a mercenary democracy where we are only bothered about how to place uh, a certain uh, policy in place or in uh, in action for a particular output so the the ends 
are becoming far more important than the means. When the means were supposed to be paramount, they were supposed to be as important as the ends, as our constitution clearly states, you know, every, every section of it. Now, here is one more issue which, which we must address. I mean, it's not about uh, 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 name calling or, uh, you know, blame game or, or, or you know, uh, holding one government uh, at fault or not the other, you know, that kind of a thing. What I'm trying to say is, in fact, the pathways to power in this country have revealed to the political class at large that there is no need to uh, tread the difficult but very necessary route of uh, uplifting every citizen in the country. Instead, the political parties can attain power by merely addressing some sections and select their narrow agendas accordingly. See, that this is what makes actually the real people and the real issues invisible. Now that's that's exactly what we saw during the entire um, you know the process of consultation or the so-called consultation of the farm laws, the passing of the farm laws, and the repeal. The entire thing actually shows this that this very large segment, the 65 percent, was not even consulted before or consulted in that at to that degree before these laws were uh, put in place. Now another another important thing is about the kind of promises which are made, you know, which is where I guess the role of the citizen comes, which is what you're trying to ask that, what do we, where do we play a role? Now, 2022 was supposed to be a very important year. This was the year when the central government promised that the farm incomes will double. Now to a poor country like this, where a majority of the farmers are poor, small and marginal, that is a stupendous promise to double the farm incomes. Has it been done? No. Let me just give you one example. This is the National Statistical Survey Organization, 2019. Between 2002 and three, as compared to between the 10 years, between that and 2012 and 13, the annual increase in farm income was 20%, as compared to 2012 and uh, 13 to till now, which has fallen down to 12%. Is that the doubling of the income which we are talking about? Now, what do we do about this? Laws are passed in parliament, which has now become an elite institution by political parties, which are only interested in getting to power, maintaining power and retaining or, or returning to power. And they form policies which are useful to let's say the, uh, the interests which seem to serve this entire system. Now that's where I'm experimenting in, uh, uh, with some a reform called citizen referendum. It is, it, it is one way, one very small way of experimenting with local level governance, where we can have participatory governance, which is more in, in terms of understanding policies and voting on them after the policy has been made. Unfortunately, we should be doing it before, but governments take us by surprise, right? We don't get to know what policy is coming next, how will it be uh, passed and how much majority or minority, well, how will, how will, you know, this all pan out because there is no consultation. There is no way that a common citizen living any, in any part of the country will get to know that so and so, so policy is coming and this is what the consultation can be. So let's do it post facto. Okay, let's do it once the policy is made, but let's have a vote which is based on policy. Now that's what I'm, I'm trying to experiment with uh, in Hyderabad. It's one of the experiments which have kept to only the civic level, where, they, where we are doing this only on the municipal level, where we are voting on issues which directly concern residents of a very small area. So that, and, and all this is done in the framework of our constitutional values. So no divisive issue is taken up, no issue which, uh, which potentially has an impact on, uh, let's say the agreed constitutional values. We do not take those issues up. So what do we take? Well, the facilities which are available or you know the um, you know the, those kind of things. So yeah, that's that's the one way the citizens can influence, I guess, policy. Yeah, thank you, Nilima. That was uh, very comprehensively explained about the referendum that your research that you're working on. Uh, Shiv, would you like to uh, comment on this? I can give you just uh, you know ninety seconds. Uh, on uh, on what specific part, uh, Namita? Sorry. Uh, uh, what uh, Nilima said about the way the farm laws were passed in parliament, if you can comment on mm. that. 
Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, it's great to hear about uh, Nilima's experiment. I think it's fabulous that, uh, you know, uh, something like that is happening uh, in the real world. Uh, I can give you a journalist's perspective, uh, you know, about, uh, about the way uh, things actually happened. Um, and uh, that is that any, uh, you know, any um, substantial argument about the farm laws was completely lost in the noise. I, I, the, the reason I, I, the reason I'm not going to comment directly on how it was passed and things like that is because uh, we, as journalists, and and Kota knows this because she's been a journalist, is we're in the middle of the storm, and we were processing, uh, uh, you know, multimedia noise from every side uh, on a story that had become a kind of hurricane, like practically overnight, uh, and therefore, uh, if there was, uh, you know, uh, th there were voices of reason. There were voices of substance. There were those who said, no, it was about communication. It was not about the substance of the laws. And there was a failure to communicate and persuade and, uh, you know, cajole and sit people down. But then there were others who said, no, but, you know, the, you know, the, this is not a farmer protest. There are other people behind the farmers who have vested interests in all of this. So uh, as a journalist, as an editor, uh, our job was basically to try and make sense of what things were, uh, you know, amidst all of the noise. Uh, uh, and I think at the end of the day, uh, nothing actually really matters because uh, those who those who had fought and defended the farm laws, uh, you know, all through it, which is the government, uh, finally repealed them. And uh, uh, this is a country where uh, elections have this big overhang in this country. Uh, you know, political compulsions uh, in many ways drive so many things. So what are you ultimately left with? Uh, you know, are, are there convictions? Uh, are you doing things for other reasons? Uh, you know, was there a failure to actually take citizens on board? And and I, I think one of the, the, the one of the metaphors that Kota used is so evocative, which is about invisibility. That is such a such a powerful and uh, uh, you know unignorable thing about both farmers and soldiers. So uh, I think yeah, I think that's what I would say about it. Okay. Thank you so much, Shiv, and uh, thanks a lot, Kulpreet, as well as uh, Kota Nilima for this uh, very interesting discussion. I'm afraid we have to end this session now. Uh, uh, it's the end of the time. Uh, I'll only add one thing to today's uh, you know, topic of Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, and that is to bring out the Constitution of India to add to it, and I would say Jai Samvidhan. So okay. that's my last word. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Well said, well said. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kulpreet Yadav, Shiv Arur, Namita Waikar, and Kota Nilima for this fantastic session. The session is presented by LIC. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. Sessions are ongoing across all three of our venues, Front Lawn, Bank of Baroda, Mughal Tent, and Darbar Hall. Hope to see you in the next session. Thank you. Hi, how do you earn your salary? Uh, definitely, you should invest some money. I will buy a smartphone for my small brother. I will give my first salary to my dad and mom. I have a lot of shock of traveling. I have a life insurance policy. Because it will be my security for me and my family. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for watching.